Thank you. Thanks kindly for that introduction. I don't know what's worse. I thought this was the graveyard shift, but actually it's the session before the drink. So, ooh. All right, but we'll make it quick, we'll make it lively. Um, thank you everybody for obviously the, the great conversations today and we're looking to wrap it up for you. Um, our first speaker is Thomas Kaczynski. Um, he is the CIO at WSSE Water. Tom obviously is the IT department there together with all of its functionalities and has extensive experience in IT and cyber resilience le leadership experience in utility industries that includes water, electric, and natural gas. And I know a lot of conversations here about how do we look at integrating that going into the future. Tom has a plethora of experience around sort of challenges from um, conception to inception to planning to implementation and obviously the O&M elements um, towards the end. Um, he's got a couple of slides and he's gonna take us through that. Uh, basically looking at AMI. It's more than a reading. Tell us more, Tom. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, is it afternoon still? Yeah, it's still afternoon. Okay, just checking. Um, let me make sure the clicker works. Ah, okay. Um, so I coined this term about 10 years ago. AMI, it's more than a reading. And it, it, it actually resulted from a lot of the work that we started to do be what I'll say beyond the meter reading itself. Um, and there's a tremendous opportunity there. We've talked about it a lot today. Uh, I'm not gonna read through all of this. Uh, what I will tell you is there's value for the customer, there's value for the utility, but there's also value for the environment. Um, AMI's changing the way, or forcing us to change the way we manage meter reading and billing in the utility. What I don't, I'm not sure that it's done is change the way we think about using the data that we have within the AMI system once we start collecting that. I want to use a couple examples just to show you. Um, we talk about anomaly detection or uh, consecutive use de detection from the customer's perspective. Well, we may, may not necessarily talk about it from the utility's perspective. So how can a anomaly detection help the utility better manage its business? As you develop profiles for consumption, okay, if we were all if we were all average customers and we all had the same meter, it's not a big deal, right? We can work it out. But we've got different meter sizes, we've got different customers. We typically have rate classes, commercial, industrial, residential. But even in the commercial class, there's ranges of customers and there's ranges of usage profiles. So AMI allows you to collect that data, develop really precise profiles of consumption at the hourly or even at the 15 minute interval level that actually gives you the ability to more accurately identify meters that are not performing to standard in a, in a quicker fashion. So in theory, on a daily basis, you could detect a meter that starts to degrade at a rate that's different than what the manufacturer profile says. That allows the utility to more quickly respond to that meter which um, allows it to actually collect more revenue, okay? So that's a switch from, or, or that's the, uh, the way you could use the anomaly detection. We talk about zero usage consumption on the meter side, right? And we say, oh, uh, somebody's not using any water. We might wanna go out there and check to see if they're borrowing water from us, right? But how do we, how do we look at it from the customer perspective, right? You're collecting meter data on an hourly basis or a 15 minute interval basis, and it identifies zero consumption at a particular reference, at a particular resonance or a particular um, usage location. In the US, it's estimated that 36 million people live alone in the US. So think about taking that zero usage consumption and turning it into a customer safety service tool. Where a, where a child or a son or daughter could register their parent in your system to report when zero usage is detected on a meter in a single day for an for a older uh, resident in the property, and you can actually turn that into a public service condition, okay? So we're rethinking the way we're using this stuff, not necessarily simply from a billing perspective, okay, but from a public safety perspective. Um, on the... On the um, utility side, we haven't really talked about water quality monitoring that much, okay, as it relates to, to AMI. But if you connect your AMI system into your hydraulic modeling system, 
You can then start to better understand water age issues in your system and identify potential areas where you should be making upgrades to the system or doing perhaps more flushing or things on a more regular basis to actually reduce water quality complaints from your customers, okay? AMI, depending on where you are as it relates to your data um, sophistication or your, your analytical capabilities, actually could be the catalyst for changing the way you manage data across the utility forever, right? Creating a new data architecture that allows you to collect data, integrate it, uh, uh, correlate it against other financial data or operational data and things like that. Things you could never do before if you didn't have a, a more sophisticated uh, information infrastructure in place, okay? Uh, did, um, we talked a little bit about earlier about the um, uh, predictive analytics and the like. That requires a very different data structure and a very different data uh, uh, architecture than traditional databases, you know, relational databases or flat file services, okay? I'm gonna go a little off script. I'm gonna just real quickly say, this is not about the technology. I'm an IT guy. I'd like to tell you this is the most complicated thing in the world, but it's actually pretty easy once you make a couple basic decisions, right? You gotta decide whether you want a fully integrated me smart meter or whether you want a meter, okay? A dumb meter with a device that's added to it, right? You've gotta decide what the frequency of meter reading is you you're gonna do. You're gonna decide whether you need two-way or one-way reading capabilities, right? You've got to decide a basic communications platform. The other thing you got to decide though is whether you're not, whether you're going to dedicate your system to a single vendor or not. And if you're not going to choose a single vendor to, to, to be your AMI provider, then that's going to change the way you address meter data management solutions and customer portals. You're likely not to buy that from the vendor that's supplying the meter device, okay? So again, it's just, a bunch of decisions you got to make to put the technology in place. But there's process changes and there's um, actually people changes as well that you need to deal with. Th this is a huge change management problem for both the utility but also the customers themselves. What I really want to focus on, and it came up briefly at the last discussion, is really how you make it a success, right? You can choose the technology, you can do all the change management, but the implementation process is where the um, rubber meets the road, right? Um, Benjamin Franklin, anybody know who Benjamin Franklin is? Okay, he said an ounce of uh, prevention is worth a pound of cure. The reality is the economics of the program degrade as the quality of the installation degrades, okay? So the worse you are at putting these things in or the longer it takes you to put these things in, the harder it is to make the benefits uh, generate the benefits. And really the focus should be initially is, is what your rollout plan and how you're going to do it. So a couple key things, right? Um, how do you decide which meters to go after, right? How do you ensure that the individuals that are installing those meters are actually, actually know where those meters are if, if in fact you have a meter, right? A lot of people just say, okay, I'm going to go to this neighborhood, I'm going to run down the street and I'm going to put all the meters in, right? And then the installer gets out there and the installer can't find half the meters that he's supposed to know because your information in your systems isn't accurate enough. But in reality, you've had a meter, out, meter reader out there month after month after month that's been trying to read the meter. And if that person hasn't read the meter in a year, why would you send an installer out to put an AMI device in? Okay, you already know it's not there, but a lot of people don't think about using the, their existing systems to plan their future installations, okay? Second thing is third-party vendors. If you're using a third-party vendor for installation, a lot of them will talk about incentive-based installations, okay? They get paid for the number they do and as fast as they do them, but what they really do is the easiest ones first, right? They forget about all the hard ones, they leave the hard ones to utility, right? Or they mess up the install, right? So it's not just about how many you do and how quickly you do, it's how accurately you do them and what the concentration rate is in the area that they've, that they've been assigned to do the installations, okay? So you gotta structure your incentive program in a way that actually achieves your results, not necessarily just pays the vendor because they got a lot done, okay? Um, on the billing system side, okay, it's important early on to decide how you're gonna handle exceptions that come in after the meter's been removed, okay? It's likely if you've got a lot of meters that you're estimating, 
that you're going to have, and not you're going to have differences in the indexes on the out meter. Okay, when you pull the meter out, that are going to be greater than what your systems have traditionally allowed for in the past. Or if your system accepts whatever comes in, you're likely to either uh, bill an exorbitant amount to the customer and move on, and the customer is going to blame the meter. They're not going to blame the fact that the meter was uh, estimated incorrectly for perhaps six months, a year, or even longer, right? So it's important that you rethink before you start how you're going to handle anomalies that fall out of your normal ranges, okay? And whether or not you're going to give some consideration to the fact that if you haven't been reading the meter for an extended period of time. So even though the new meter going in has an index, or, or, or the meter coming out has an index that's five times higher than what you normally would allow, okay, you may want to give credit for, um, or you may actually want to bill only a portion of that adjusted index to ensure that you continue to go forward with the program. Because the more exceptions you get that are higher than what the customer's been paying in the past, the greater the likelihood there's going to be more complaints and people could shut down your shut down your program. Um, the other thing to watch out for is really uh, what I refer to, well, large, large deployments are difficult, right? So depending on your approach to installations, is it revenue driven? Or are you going to go after the, the highest cost customers or the highest revenue customers first? Or are you going to go after highest estimates? I mean, you have to come up with a strategy and you have to stick with it. Is it going to be geographical, a geographic focus within some other criteria? There will be, with large installations, okay, what I refer to as a push for benefits, okay? I've seen it twice in my career, right? You start out and everything's working great and we're getting a whole bunch done and we're saying, oh, we're going to focus in this neighborhood and we're going to get 98% done in this neighborhood. And then somebody walks in the door and he says, you know, this is working so well. We want twice as many benefits in half as much time. And they just throw hundreds of people out to install meters. Now you've got all these meters scattered across the enterprise, okay, that have all been installed at different intervals, right? And what happens? Well, what happens is 15 years from now, when you've got to go out and replace those meters, it's going to cost you three times as much as it would have if you had a more disciplined approach to the installation. You'd be able to go into one area, make those changes, pull those meters out, move on to the next area. So, so it's important once you decide on your implementation strategy to ensure that you maintain that strategy going forward. So that's about all I have. I'll turn it up. Great, thanks Tom um, for those pearls of wisdom. Um, next up we've got Yanni Huchlenberg. Um, so he has a background in engineering and a BCom in financial management. Currently, Yanni is the director at the Civil Engineering Services in George Municipality. He's a registered professional engineer and practiced for about two decades before moving into public, um, into the public sector. Um, Yanni's story is quite interesting. I mean, sort of a couple of years ago, actually more than a decade ago, um, there were a couple of flood breaks, and obviously the municipality needed to understand a little bit better for where that water is going, and actually didn't have much information around that. So Yanni didn't waste a crisis, um, and so he's going to share with us the roadmap for AMI and George, whether it was smart or not. Thanks, Yanni. Um, we're going to quickly show you what the roadmap for George was and um, how we came about on our project. Um, George municipality required um, to reduce our non-revenue water, and uh, so my slide is now broken. The, there used to be all the um, all our targets were showing there, um, and what we wanted to achieve and why we implemented the project. Um, and this project was initiated in uh, mid 20, uh, 2022. Um, Post that, we appointed a consultant, um, and subsequent to that, we also appointed a, a meter supplier and a, a contractor. Um, and we did a quick um, cost-benefit analysis. We didn't go for the whole long route. Some of the other utilities went for a very long master plan or thesis on it. Um, and we installed five test meters for a year, and then um, we um, commenced with the installation in um, to, um, mid last year, and up to now we've installed 4,700 meters in the ground. Um, there's a few pictures of 
of the more complex um, installations um, which we had um, on site. Our implementation program and how we involved our stakeholders, um, you know, not expect to read all the detail, but this just shows you how we engage with the, um, the customers, how we alert them that we are coming to your premises, please be notified that we want to get can access to your site. That is our flow diagram which we showed them. This is a, the process that we follow through. And then the last step is in um, after we installed it, now this is the process that US customer can follow to register on the application to enable to unlock the full benefits of a, of a smart meter that you can um, log into your device and, and, and enjoy the benefits <coughs> of it. But um, as any project, um, there's always issues and the subject is it smart or not. Um, so we, our first meter, um, that was we called it the MK0, which is a pilot meter. Um, when we started off, we um, received the MK1 meters, which is um, just a term for how it was assembled. And unfortunately, it didn't match the MK0 meters. And the first 900 meters, we had to replace all of them again. So we started the project last year, and we stopped to replace all the meters with the MK1 meters again. And um, then we um, got the, um, the MK, sorry, the MK0 meter was a pilot one, and the MK1 is the one we, we took, uh, um, took out and we put the MK2 ones in. Um, and uh, at the latter part of last year, the MK2 meters also started failing. So our current failure rates on the MK2s are 13%. And uh, the breakdown of that is 43% of the 13% is due to the boxes or the assemblies. Um, then workmanship is roughly 16%, and 41% is unclassified or unknown that we don't know whether the, the customer drove over it or whether um, we couldn't detect the, the fault when the teams were there replacing it. But as you can imagine, driving past, that's not a water feature. That is a smart meter that leaked. Um, in someone's garden, um, and we currently have water restrictions in our in our in our town. So the public um, has a massive outcry if they see water squirting up in the air, and they can't allow it to water their garden. So, in terms of um, the, some of the lessons that we we learned, um, and Thomas also mentioned in terms of quality, um, quality of your components, um, firstly of of, of the, what the contractor supplies to connect your meter to your, to your system is essential. Um, and that can have a, a major effect on, on the outcome of your, of your project. Um, we had a big issue in terms of the, of the quality of the components of the meter assembly, not the meter itself, but just the meter box. And that's where the bulk of the failures originated. Um, and you can see we took some measurements and cut meters and fittings open to see what, what caused it and what can be um, the, the reason for the problem. Um, in terms of, of the whole process, what is important is when you uh, do capture the information after you've installed it and want to get it onto your billing side, is garbage in, garbage out. So if we don't capture the information accurately in the field um, and you connect the meter to the wrong address or the wrong details, Afterwards, it's a massive exercise to, to rematch that data. So you must carefully plan how you're going to capture your data and make sure your data process is quite uh, streamlined. And that also allows you that your account details are correct and the right customer get the right um, a bill. And that all the details of your accounts are up to date. In terms of the billing cycle, that's one thing that we had a big outcry is now we moved from a historic um, a meter data that's been measured um, three monthly or monthly, and now suddenly people get bills every month. And now, due to our water restrictions, we've got step tariffs. So now, suddenly, in the first month, they get historic bill plus now this bill at the peak rate. So there's a massive outcry for, from the public why are my bill now more? Um, it's because of the, uh, the two months or three months of data or water consumption being um, billed in one month at the high rate. So the public was quite upset due to the, the change in, in the bill account. And of course, the, the smart meter can also read more accurately, so the, the consumption might be higher just due to the nature that you replace the meter. 
So in terms of the, the last step is just to make sure that your interface between you, as, uh, the utility on the municipality and your supplier is set up before the time and that means you do at the time when you do your pilot, don't wait and start implementing the project and then um, realize that there's some of these issues that you haven't resolved yet. And part of our process, you can see at the bottom, we even built our own test bins to, to test meters and to make sure that um, when we get meters that it is actually compliant and that uh, the, the supplier did only supply your meter and they claim it was tested, but you actually can confirm that you, your meter is compliant to test, normal test pressures. A big issue that we also experience with uh, our local our politicians and, and the demographics of, of our communities is our neighboring municipality, they installed prepaid meters, and suddenly when we bought smart meters, then they said, no, but this is also a prepaid meters. And um, we had Facebook and local WhatsApp groups complaining that, that uh, we are now also installing a prepaid meter and uh, where we're doing a smart meter. And it took extensive um, um, client relationship management to, to change the message and to install trial meters in the different communities that the people can physically see, but this, is, this meter can only do one-way communication. It can't react back and, and, and shut off the water or post, post any um, abnormal usage. And that's roughly I tell you what my story is. I think the gist of that is a meter is not a meter is not a meter. Thank you. Um, our last um, sort of presenter and speaker today had to step in at the last minute, and so obviously we thank you very much. So this is Clayton Muller, who you have seen around earlier in the day. <laughs> Um, so he comes from a finance background um, and worked a lot with FMGC, uh, working for the Mars Group in France and Canada. So yes, making chocolates. Wonderful. Um, he returned to Cape Town and that, to do his MBA and that just so happened to coincide with the drought. And he ended up with a project around strategic management to digitize water and help drive demand management. Um, and that ended up involving into a startup company called Apex Innovation. He now designs and builds software programs to be a systems integrator to a large variety of both hardware and communications protocols. Um, so Clayton's going to talk to us a little bit about the experiences of Swan in the private sector and AMI. Thanks. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, I feel a bit like Andre Pollard coming in at the, at the last minute here to, <laughs> <laughs> to swing it through the post in the rain against England. But um, yeah, so I, I seen this presentation about an hour ago. <laughs> so please bear with me. Um, basically, I've worked with Mark um, over the years. Uh, he is uh, traditionally from an engineering background, um, obviously working in public sector. Uh, and now based in the UK. So we come from a private sector section, and that was where we worked on a couple of projects together, specifically on the commercial side. Uh, we have one specific company, uh, GSK. Um, so they do uh, pharmaceuticals, and they're embarking on a journey um, to, to look at sustainability for water. And I suppose that's where this tie-in comes in with Swan on how SWAN can play a bigger role in, in private sector, not only public sector, like we've discussed through here. So there's the submetering portion on residential, and then there's the really the commercial side. So if we look at uh, what private sector is doing, um, and if you look at a factory environment like a, like a GSK, it can be a mini snapshot of a big, um, big municipality or a bigger area. Same principles apply, where you've got your supply of, of water, uh, then you've got your usage of water, and then you've got your reporting on that water. So like GSK, a lot of the supply side, they're trying to improve that and increase that. So that means trying to harvest rainwater, trying to use their car wash water um, by reconditioning it and making it use for potable water, then using it through their, their processes and eventually having the drivers to be able to report on that, uh, on, on how they're using that water. So the incentive there for commercial uh, customers is not necessarily RAND value in water, 
but it's about creating an environment where they where they're viewed as sustainably um, or good for sustainability. And there's a whole bunch of uh, European standards that they can form in through, through whether it's global sustainability goals, ESGs, uh, European water, etc. So there's a big drive uh, globally on becoming compliant on sustainability, which I think is uh, which is a good driver for for commercial customers to be able to do uh, to do that. So GSK is currently in the final process of getting their the water stewardship program, uh, which is the is the benchmark uh, for trying to trying to encourage that. Um, ultimately, the goal is to create a volumetric accounting base for water. So the idea is to make water an actual balance sheet item uh, for companies, and that's how you can drive drive that incentive and that growth. Uh, these, are the, these are the strategic drivers that we're looking at uh, putting in place for them. Um, so obviously responsible, responsibility and use, um, measuring across everything. Um, and when we, when we look at commercial customers, sometimes we have to get very granular uh, on that usage because they're using it for different processes and different flows. So if you can think of juice companies, uh, cleaning companies, pharmaceutical companies, they're trying to understand exactly where that water is going and trying to reduce waste as much as possible um, so that they can get the best possible result. Um, obviously, that uh, data reporting uh, is also then very, very important, both on a global standard as well as for the companies and the group of companies uh, that are trying to, trying to look at that. Um, so regulatory compliance obviously is, is the main driver that's pushing uh, pushing this for for commercial customers, uh, and then and then at the end they've got the vol uh, voluntary and mandatory uh, sustainability reporting. So obviously that hopefully will move a lot of people on the voluntary side, but on the eventually that might become mandatory uh, for a whole bunch of commercial customers. GSK, as far as we know, is the first in South Africa to embark on the water stewardship program. And they are then rolling it out globally. So Cape Town is their, is their pilot project. Um, so effectively, as I said, what you can look at is in a factory environment uh, can be broken down to similar view as a, as a small municipality or a small estate or a, uh, whatever it is that you've got your surrounding area and you, and you can then zone it. Um, so by creating zones, creating your flows, creating your, your, your outlet points, you can then identify where that water is going. Um, exactly like that. Uh, and then you've got your different metering points that, that you try and measure to try and be able to create an excellent balance. Um, so that could be from water meters to energy meters to, uh, to combining multi-utilities uh, in the end of the day, whether it's PV uh, as well and combining it together. Um, so those are just uh, those are just the communication hubs, exactly the same as you would would have in a municipality. So whether you you're looking at uh, multi protocols, um, LoRa, um, oops, uh, whether you're looking at LoRa, whether you're looking at 4G, whether you're looking at Ethernet, um, all of those can potentially play a role in how you're reporting. But that's just getting the data out. So as I said, these are um, these are your your overlapping overlapping points on, on driving it. So hardware and connectivity is your baseline. Without that, you can't do anything. Um, so taking that through, putting it into a meter management uh, system, be able to record that data ship, data, and then transferring it into the water stewardship. So showing how you're using sustainability to do, to be able, or using water stewardship to create sustainability. Uh, and then on the other side is exactly how that ties back in from being compliant, disclosing that information and reporting that information to the bodies that are applicable, whether it's ESGs, Global Sustainability Goals, or Water Stewardship. Um, and I think that is it. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Clayton, and, and sort of well done in stepping in at the last minute. Um, yeah, thank you. I think thanks to our speakers again. Another round of applause, please. I mean, we just heard, you know, pearls of wisdom from Thomas, some of the pitfalls when you're starting out from Yanni, 
and potentials for private sector, SEZs, um, industrial parks, um, and other areas from a stewardship perspective and EGS, ESG reporting as well. Um, before I go to my questions, is there anything burning from the audience that you'd like to pose to the panel? Oh, wow, that was quick. <laughs> um, do we have somebody helping with the mic? No? Okay. Okay. I was saying using AI. Um, I would definitely not wait too long, but um, there's good lessons that we learned, which if someone else could have told me these lessons, we would have implemented that. So the mistakes that we make, we would not make again. So we already engaged for other municipalities that were planning to do similar rollouts and told us what happened with us, and we, uh, we shared the, the, the mistakes we made, and we learned that. So in terms of the, the process, um, where we are in terms of the, the supplier, we might consider um, joining our um, the, the contractor and the, um, and the valve supplier as one, in, um, one entity, but it also has its, its own pitfalls, but it's definitely an option, or alternatively, that um, we use contractors to install, and we were wanting to push it very fast, and we used quite a number of contractors, and that's where quality control probably went a bit difficult to manage and for that we uh, maybe if we do it a bit slower and um, rather ramp it up uh, introduce a project slower and then maybe do it in-house and then see what is your um, the issues that you had and then probably ramp it up thereafter might be a slightly better ap approach if I could learn from our mistakes thank you great thanks Yanni so please come in Hello. Um, so this question to um, Thomas Tom. Um, just I think I know the answer, but I just want to. What is the you used to work for DC Water? What is the, the when was the first installation, and then um, there was a AMI 2.0. Um, how long did it take before you started an, um, a second rollout? So the first one was uh, in the 2000 time frame. It lasted for about five years, so 2000 to 2005 was the initial implementation of AMI. Uh, it was a one-way system, so we couldn't do a lot of demand reads or things like that or uh, program over the air, the <coughs> re-frequency and stuff like that. Uh, in 2015, 2016, we started uh, down the path of an upgrade, and it took about uh, three and a half years to replace all of the uh, 135,000 meters. And uh, we actually replaced the meter and the MTU device with the second gener or third generation device that provides two-way reading, over-the-air reprogramming uh, that gave us a lot more benefits. Uh, thanks. I'm going to step out of uh, MC mode and ask a question. Um, I'm On rollouts, I'm... I'm really interested in the potential to, th you, know, we, you know, a lot of discussions have been about rollout from an operational point of view and a technical engineering point of view. But one of the questions in my mind about AMI is how will it change customer behavior if customers have more information, et cetera, et cetera. So in, I'll give you an example of introducing prepaid uh, electricity meters in Cape Town. There was just going to be a kind of standard a rollout based on operational, you know, whatever was sensible operationally. And there was a conversation with a, a, an academic researcher at a key point, which said, actually, hang on, the rollout of prepaid is going to change how people engage with energy consumption. So let's do this in a way that we can learn. And then they changed the rollout so that it basically allowed it to be a form of randomized control trial. And they were able to learn incredibly valuable information about how the introduction of a prepaid meter changed people's consumption behavior. And I'm wondering whether you've got, whether you know of any examples or whether you think it's feasible to do something similar with AMI rollout to roll it out that allows you to actually have a sort of control group and a, and a, and a, and a, and a treatment group and allows you to actually learn about how it changes behavior as you roll it out. Um, so let me say one thing about customers first. It, during the rollout, uh, people assume the customer is always going to cooperate. Don't assume the customer is going to cooperate. You've got to manage the customer through the installation process, and they're going to want to change your schedule. Um, so, so that's the first thing. But um, I think on, on the behavioral side, 
uh, a couple things. There's there's one, the payment, okay? And we're doing a, a bit of analysis now internally because we're in the process of planning an AMI implementation at uh, WSOC Water, where I am now. Um, and we've got data that tells us that on, air, uh, on a percentage basis, about 10% uh, of our, cu our our customers pay um, faster and more current on an actual meter reading versus an estimated meter reading, okay? Uh, doesn't mean they don't pay the estimate. They eventually do pay the estimate, but they typically pay it late. Um, I think at our experience at DC Water, as we started to demonstrate to customers their usage profile as it related to either others in their neighborhood which they have the ability to do, uh, and not just at a monthly level, but at a at a weekly or quarter uh, qu uh, weekly or or hourly level. Okay, they could see where they fit in the average. Okay, or wh how they relate to the average. Okay, we talk about averages all the time, but nobody really knows if they're average or not. But these kinds of analysis allowed people to look at it and they go, you know what? I'm really not a real good customer because I'm using three times as much as my neighbor where I'm using three, mu three times as much as my neighborhood, right? So, so people do, uh, you know, in a lot of cases, they, they look at that and they start to change their behavior. Their cons consumption goes down. Um, but some of the other features that we provided, like uh, anomaly detection, consecutive use, um, you know, we virtually eliminated high bill complaints or disputed bills because, you know, very few disputed bills because people are now getting an accurate meter reading. They're getting noticed when their bills are high Right? And instead of calling you up and complaining about a high bill, they're actually sending you emails telling you thank you for letting me know because you know, my bill's not going to be two times what it would have been had I not known this. And, and we do those on a four-hour interval every, every four times a day. We read our meters four times a day, 24 hours of reads every um, time we get them in, and we run those analytics against that um, consumption, and we're able to tell people, hours after an event as opposed to days or weeks or months after an event. Sure, that's great. I mean, you know, having data at your fingertips to change behavior. Excellent. I'm not seeing any other hands. Uh, Clayton, can you maybe tell us just what are the lessons you found in the private sector to be transferable to the public sector in some of the pieces that you've presented Well, it actually might even tie back into the question that you just had. Um, we had the opportunity during the drought to uh, measure on AMI some student accommodation and some student raises in Stellenbosch. So there was a very nice control group. We had two buildings with 50 apartments each, single, single unit students um, that were using it, and we measured their consumption on AMI from level three to level seven of the stages. One, we made available a mobile application, uh, which would give them instant data or hourly data on a daily basis, and we would also give them the ability to set their alarms to warn them once they reached uh, the levels that the city had implemented. I think initially it was 200, then 150, then 87, and then 50. Uh, and then the two uh, running in comparison over a period of 14 months was an excellent way to view the consumption behavior patterns. Uh, and effectively, the end result was that the one that did have the mobile application ended up being below 50 liters per person per day, whereas the one uh, that didn't have the mobile application was above. Thank you for that. Um, Thomas, you had mentioned some of the customers had devices already. Um, you know, just what were their expectations and what were some of the benefits around around shifting to the smart metering? So, um, since we had AMI devices for such a long period of time, it became the norm to get hourly meter reading data. And when you didn't get the hourly meter reading data because p perhaps there was an interruption in the network, okay, in the U.S., most of the... Um, networks for AMI right now are privately owned. They're typically radio and then cellular backhaul. Um, if, we didn't, if we didn't provide a reading or we didn't provide a notification on a high bill, that's when people started to complain because they got so used to having access to that information, 
okay, and and literally, you know, within hours of it of it coming into the system, that it became a problem not providing it. So so your your the expectation from the customer perspective changed dramatically from I don't care about my usage in a lot of cases to I want to know and you didn't tell me and now I have a problem. I mean we had. On average, 75% of our customers used our online portal, which is pretty high for a water utility uh, as, a, as a registered user base. So, so I think that, you know, the switch was, you know, I don't get what I expect. You need to start providing this in a more timely fashion. Sorry, just one last thing. Can you touch a little bit on just the benefits for the larger community? Um, yeah, I think, um, I mean, smart metering is one part of, uh, one water solution. Um, you know, as a water utility, you're re you're responsible for every everything from the source to to treatment, and then ultimately putting that resource back into the system for use again. Um, you know, certainly conservation. You know, uh, reduction in carbon footprint. Okay, uh, but even but making people more aware of the value of water and the risks in the absence of it, okay, and the potential implications of not having that resource available to you, um, you know, really changes the mindset of the community and makes the community more focused. But if you're good at what you do, especially from a treatment and delivery perspective, it drives economic development in the community as well, right? So, so being able to provide a reliable, safe source of water that, that um, to the community actually helps grow the community as well. I mean, it's always interesting. It's, I mean, across Africa, uh, this constant tension between where people focus effort and energy and electricity without a doubt wins. Um, even though you go a week without water and you die, but the, the focus is on, is on electricity. I mean, even if you look here, the change behavior apart from day zero is around load shedding and electricity. You know, so the discussions around water, its value, et cetera, and people's ability to pay or, or they want to pay for that is, is quite an interesting discussion. Good. Um, I'm seeing no more hands. So, Yanni, I th oh. Um, so... Just the idea of getting customers to engage, that's wildly impressive to have 75% of people engaging in an online portal and similarly like downloading and utilizing a mobile application is wild. The, the comparison to ESCOM is a really good one because um, to quote someone, um, one of the politicians in Rwanda, the best way to get people on board with the program is you don't give them a choice. So <laughs> uh, like ESCOM does for us, we have to adapt, like there's, there's nothing else to do. Whereas with water, it's more of a opt-in, it could be nice for the environment, oh, maybe there's gonna be something at some point. Some people in Gauteng at the moment are struggling with kind of their water being super, super brown and undrinkable, it doesn't really affect me, so I can just carry on. How do you get, sorry, back to the question, how do you get that level of such positive and constructive change management, getting people engaged in this process? I think it's. I mean, it's a it's a constant communication. One of the first bullets up on the on my slide was communication, communicate, communicate. Right? You got to start out telling people why you're doing it. You're doing, but then you got to say these are the benefits you're getting from it. Right? And oh, by the way, we're going to provide these to you as a service. Right? I talked a little bit about the the safety and health issue that you could implement if you wanted to choose to do so. Nobody in the utility sector does that today, but, but that's a potential opportunity to, to change your relationship with your customer and not make it about simply collecting the bill, right? So, uh, but I think from an adoption perspective, the reality is that, uh, I mean, um, the D.C. area, you know, has, has a high technology um, intelligence level, so it's, it's a little bit easier to get technology in, in people's hands out there, um, but it also places a bit bigger burden on the folks that build and create that technology as well to create it in a way that it's not hard to use, right? It sh you should be able to pick it up and it should just work. And and that's the expectation on, on the technology side now that was created with, this, with the iPhone, right? So 
Um, it's about recognizing, you know, what your customers want, how you have to deliver it, okay, and and how you need to make it work for them and not necessarily simply work for you. And that will drive the adoption, I think. Great. Thanks, Thomas. I think we're almost at the end. And we've all been on tinter hooks around Georgia's uh, municipality's roadmap. So, Yanni, maybe you can close, up, close us off. Um, where to from here for George Municipality? I think we're going to look back at our information that we gathered and just take stock and decide... Um, what is the best way out? I think we might have started off too fast a bit, and we can consider maybe um, a slightly slower pace. And and because we, we, the project initiated initiated off when we had a flood in 2021, um, and the politicians asked, "Where's our water?" And nobody could tell us where the water is because the pipes were broken and washed away, and we had no meter. So and they wanted to know where's the water. So that's where they said, "But put put in something smarter." And that's where the, the driver was. Now, next year, you must have the meters in the ground. Um, and we showed them we can put it in, but we need to plan it and, and do it at an at a achievable rate within teams and capabilities of, of the contractors and the suppliers. So um, we're definitely going to continue with the, the, the journey and learn from the other, other municipalities what, they, what they've done. And I also already heard that there's a change in the technology again, so which we also can consider um, amending our plans and, um, and improving that. But um, we're definitely going to proceed um, and, and, and install more meters. Sure. Thank you for that, Yanni. And good luck with the uh, May elections coming on board and <laughs> that political pressure. Um, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and sharing of lessons learned. And thank you, everybody, for your time and attention. Thank you.